pray for the Sunday school as they leave this morning. Is they're going out this morning, right? Yes. Father, we just do lift up the children before you, Lord, the young people. And we, Lord, I'm just reminded when you were here on earth, Lord, you took the little ones in your hand and you said that they should come to you. We mustn't hinder them and that you wanted to bless them. So this morning we ask just as you bless those little young children that came came to you, we pray this morning as they come to hear from your word that you would bless them this morning. Bless those who teach them this morning, Lord. Give them the word of God, the anointing of God to be upon them. May those words be of eternal value in those young children's lives, we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the Sunday school. Amen. While they are leaving, um, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open it in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm just going to read the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being, speak, uh, being dead, he still speaks. And by faith, Enoch was taken away that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. May God bless his word. Father, we thank you for your precious word, Lord. And as we come now, Lord, to try and attempt, Lord, in, 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 in the feeble words that we have to bring justice to your word, all we can ask this morning is that you anoint your precious word, Lord. And that the very words that go out, Lord, be not of a man, but that of you, Lord. And I pray that any word that comes from the flesh that is of human form will just fall to the ground and turn to naught. But that which is of you will go into the hearts of your people, Lord. And may we hear what it is the Spirit is saying to each and every one of us this morning. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Without faith, it is difficult to please the Lord. It is hard to please the Lord. No. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible possible to please the Lord. It is not possible to please the Lord if we do not have faith. And we know that the Bible teaches us in many, many verses, and I'm so glad and we're praying this morning here, and I love it when the Lord just gives a scripture, and it just is a scripture and what the Lord is teaching and showing laid upon your heart, and, and, and Dion read the scripture this morning, he has no idea what I'm talking about. It's in Romans 1 and many other verses. It says, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3 verse 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. You see, faith is not just something that is an option. <laughs> it is the absolute requirement that we have because the Bible says without it, it is impossible to please God. We just read that Enoch had this wonderful testimony that he what? Pleased God. <laughs> and it was reckoned to him to such righteousness, he never even saw death. He was simply taken to be with the Lord, just as he is. What a wonderful privilege. He, 
he certainly had. You see, faith is not an option. It is life. For the just shall live by faith. And when it says we shall live by faith, it means that everything that we do has to be in faith. And we often, as Christians, we sometimes just get caught up in life, isn't it? And we get ourselves just doing things and making plans and going off and doing things. And life is life. We just live. But the Bible says, no, the just shall live by faith. And I'm reminded of that scripture in James chapter 4, verse 13. It says this. It says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, I will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make profit, whereas you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor, appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, and we shall live, and then do this or that. But now you boast in arrogance. Such boasting is evil. You see, God expects us to live so much in faith that everything that we do, every plan that we do, we do it in faith in Him. Because we must understand, as it says, that life can just be gone in a flash, as we know. It can go so quickly. And so we have to live a life that is living full in faith. But how do we do that? How do we live in faith? What is this faith that the Bible is talking about that it is impossible to please God? Well, first of all, to, to live in faith, to have a, a life that is led by faith, we have to be as Christ. And that's probably why the Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that we should have the mind of Christ in us. We've got to have Christ's mind in us to be able to live a life of faith. And then I'm reminded of what Jesus did and what Jesus said right throughout, especially in, in the Gospel of John. How many times when he did certain things, he would say to them, it's not I that, I that I say these things. It's not even my words that I say, but my Father's. Everything Jesus was doing was lined up with what his Father was saying. In every aspect of his life, the just shall live by faith. So Jesus did what his father did. And he set the example for us. We should be listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. What the Father is telling us through the grace and the might of his Holy Spirit in our hearts. And that's how he expects us to live. And so that's why the Bible tells us in, 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 in Romans 12 verse 2 that it is actually not possible to do this just on your own. It says you, you, have, you can't be conformed. Because if we just carry on and live life as we do in this world, we find out that the world starts shaping our thoughts, isn't it? If, if we live and, on, on, on circumstance around us and, and we look at the, at, the, at the news, and we can end up getting depressed. And the news is pretty depressing. I don't know if you know, but notice that. And we'll end up that our minds will be conformed into what the world wants to think. It says, no, we need our minds transformed. To be renewed in our minds, transformed, so that we can prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We have to start thinking like Christ. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in every aspect of our lives. But you see, in Hebrews 6, it doesn't just say that uh, uh, it is impossible to please God if we don't have faith. The first thing it says in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to believe God. But then it says this, it says, for he who comes to God, first of all, must what? Believe that he is. Okay? Now that sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? You must believe that he is. How can you go to someone that you don't believe that he is? Now for, for us believers as Christians, if I asked you to believe that God is, of course you're going to say, yes, I do. Of course, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that. But you see, not everyone is like that. You see, there are people out there that, 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 that in all honesty, struggle with the thought, is God really God? Many people out there, in fact, the vast majority of people, do they really believe that God is? You know. They might, you ask them, it's an uncomfortable question, isn't it? They don't even really like you talking about it, you know. 
you mention God, they get all uncomfortable and start rather talking about football or something sad. But they don't like talking about God because do they really believe he is? Well, you know, you, 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 know, you, you, you have your thoughts, you, know, you, you have your beliefs, I have mine. You know, I believe what I believe. But the very foundation is starting off, you need to believe that he is. I remember there was a, a guy that I listened to as many years ago. He was a Russian guy, he's testing. He grew up in Russia, his, his whole family generations in Russia, and they grew up in the, really in the time of absolute atheism. So he was a through and through atheist. His family was an atheist. The government was atheist. The school was atheist. God was never mentioned. They were taught there's no such thing as a God. We just beings, we evolved, and so for him it never ever was an issue, it never was a debate, it was a settled deal, there is no God, he never gave God a thought throughout his entire life, his family never gave God a thought, they're atheists, that's it, God never comes into the conversation because he doesn't exist, he's just not there, no issue. But what happened in this young man's life one day, his brother had committed some crime, I don't know what the crime was, but the, 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 whether it was the KGB or the police or whatever were hounding him. And they searched and searched for him and they couldn't find him and days and days they would come and knock at the family's door and where's your, where's your brother? I don't know. And he honestly hadn't seen his brother in a long time. He didn't know his brother had gotten into trouble with the law. All he knows, his brother had left the house and he had, they hadn't seen him in ages. But the police were onto them, obviously believing that they had contact with him, which they didn't. And every, after a long time, they got frustrated. They couldn't find the brother. He probably fled the country. They arrested him because they couldn't find the brother. So they put him in jail. So he's sitting in jail, obviously not very happy because he'd done nothing wrong. He doesn't even know what his brother's done wrong. He's got nothing to do with his brother. He doesn't even know where the guy is. But here he is sitting in jail. And after spending many days in jail, he started to get really, really angry. Think of yourself, what on earth am I doing here? I did nothing wrong. And what's worth is the authorities know he's done nothing wrong. But they've locked him up anyway. So one day, out of a act of frustration, he found himself getting so angry, he started shouting at God. And he said, it's all your fault. You, God, why didn't you, why didn't you allow this? And suddenly it hit him. What am I doing? Where did that come from? I've never my entire existence even thought of God. He doesn't exist. Why am I angry at him? And suddenly it hit him just like that. That somehow deep inside, within him, in his soul, he knew that he did. He knew that he is God. And he fell down on his knees and he cried out to him. And this prison was just filled with the glory as Jesus appeared to him. And he could give his life to the Lord. And that man became a missionary and uh, ended up going to Africa, ended up going to uh, Botswana, actually, in the Kalahari Desert. And he ministered to the, uh, the, the desert people, as they call them, the Kalahari, the Bushman people, and started to learn their language and gave their gospel to them. And I understand... One of the things that happened, I don't know if any of you remember a film many years ago, it was called The God Must Be Crazy. Anyone had ever seen that funny film? Now, the little bushman that plays in that film, uh, he's just a bushman. He's the, he, went, he played in that film and he went back to his village. Now, apparently the first person that this Russian guy led to the Lord and baptized was that little bushman's wife. Isn't that amazing? A man that believed that God didn't exist, but something, in an instant, in a moment, he realized that he is. You see, God says, <laughs> first of all, you must believe that he is. You see, it always amazes me when I listen to the people in the world, and I listen to things that happen. Now, the world out there, do they acknowledge God? No. They deny that he exists. We know that. They teach it in schools, in universities, whatever. There is no such thing as a God. Why is it then, whenever calamity strikes on a huge scale, the first person they blame is God? Why is it that one of the first things they ever say is, well, where was your God then? Hang on a second, there is no God. What's your problem? Either there is a God or there isn't a God. If there isn't a God, well, then you blame yourself. Blame someone else. 
You see, <laughs> deep down within every single person, they actually do know. But the world chooses to brush him aside. And there might be someone listening to me this morning, or even, even via the, 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 the live stream this morning, that somehow you decided in your heart, look, I don't want anything to do with this God. <laughs> you see, I, 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 just, I, just, I just want none of that. I don't like religion. I don't like this stuff, this religious stuff of yours. I want nothing to do with that. It doesn't change the fact that God is God. <laughs> Whether you decide to ignore him or not, does nothing to the fact that he is God. He doesn't change. It doesn't matter. And if you decide, if you think in your heart, I just don't like religion, I don't like this stuff, well, you're in good company. Jesus didn't like religion himself. He wasn't the greatest fan of the religious. Neither was John the Baptist, by the way. They didn't, you see, believing that God is God, believing him the way he wants, got nothing to do with religion. He's saying the first thing that you need to do is to understand and believe that he is. You see, even as Christians, we say we believe in God. But sometimes, when things go wrong, and you pray, and you pray, and it doesn't happen, we have this little doubt in our heart. Maybe God's not here. Maybe God's angry at me. Maybe God's just not there right now. Maybe he's just, I don't know. Faith says you need to believe that he is. Even when you can't hear him. Even when you can't see him. Even when it makes no sense. You have to believe that he is. Otherwise, you cannot please him. It is impossible to please him. It's easy to believe him and to trust him when things are going well. But when he is silent, we still need to believe that he is. The next thing it says in in, 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 in verse 6 of uh, Hebrews 11, it says that we need to believe that he is. And then it says next that he is a what? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder. So you have to believe that he is, first of all. Otherwise, forget it. If you believe that he is, now you have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I like that. I like that. So what does that mean? That he's a rewarder for those. I like the word reward because now I think if I diligently receive him, I'm just going to receive this great, I'm going to receive something, right? That's what it says. He's going to reward me for seeking him. Does that mean now when I come to him in faith and I believe that he is, now I must believe that he will reward me. So whatever I ask, he will give me. You see, that's often where this, what is that name it and claim it stuff came from, isn't it? If I ask and believe with my whole heart, as I'm sure Dion would have loved to do, for a red Ferrari, he will give it to me. (laughs) Does he do it? No. He doesn't. (laughs) You see, faith is not as much what we get. It's what we're willing to receive. It's what we're willing to receive from him. We must trust him. He says, because he will, give, he will be, be a rewarder for, some, for something. And that doesn't mean that whatever we ask for, he's going to give. So how does that make any sense then? How does that become a reward? Especially when things are going wrong. Now, I don't know about you, but I've certainly many times that maybe I've been sick or someone's been sick or something has gone wrong in life and I've prayed and I've prayed and I'm, it hasn't happened. You ever had that? You really trust God for something. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's just something that you really, really, really been holding on to into faith and it just isn't happening. And sometimes the actual opposite starts to happen. And you find it hard to believe. 
you find it starting at finding it more difficult to trust. It just feels like your faith is starting to fail a little bit. Because no matter how much I ask, it's just not happening. And sometimes the trials and the things that come upon you, you've prayed so much, Lord, please let it stop. Maybe there's abuse coming your way and you've prayed, Lord, please let it stop, let it go away, but it doesn't. And your faith gets a little bit weaker because it's like he's just not, why is he not hearing? Why is he not answering? I'm not asking for something difficult. I'm asking for something very small. But yet, it doesn't happen. You see, when we read Hebrews 11, we read incredible stories. It's called, not called the book of the heroes of faith for nothing, isn't it? We read about these heroes of faith. We read about the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and of Joseph and Moses, how the Red Sea split. We read of Joshua, how the walls of Jericho fell. We read of these incredible miracles that happened through these absolute heroes of faith. And we stand in awe of their faith. And if you look in verse 32 from, uh, of, of Hebrews 11, in verse 32 it carries on and it says this. It says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets who all through faith they subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of meekness they were made strong. They became valiant in battle. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens and women even received the dead raised back to them. That's the heroes of faith. <clears throat> and we see this. And it says, because of faith, all these things happen. Then we think, what's wrong with my faith? What's wrong with me? Why isn't the Lord doing what, he, what I asked him to do? Why isn't something happening? I've been praying so long and nothing is happening. When I look at all these heroes of faith, by faith they did this, by faith they did that, by faith they did this, and yet it doesn't. And even Jesus said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain it will be removed. And you know you've got the faith of a mustard seed, and you've told this mountain to remove a thousand times over, but the beast is still standing in front of you this morning. What is wrong with my faith? Nothing. Nothing's wrong with you. Absolutely nothing. Listen, there's another group that the Bible talks about just a little bit uh, further on. This group didn't have all these things happen. The mouths of lions weren't stopped. The fires weren't quenched. They weren't relieved from their agony. They went through it all. Carry on. It carries on in verse 35. It says this, others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scornings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stunned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered without, with sheepskins and goatskins, desolate, being afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, in dens, in caves of the earth. What's wrong with that group of people? Maybe there's some sin in their lives that stopped them from receiving all these promises that the other heroes of faith received. Maybe there was something just a little bit amiss with their faith because they didn't get relief. They walked throughout their entire life and ended up dying just as miserable as they've been walking through their life. What went wrong? Maybe there's some curse upon their life that wasn't broken. Something issue in their life that wasn't dealt with. Well, what does the Bible say? It says in verse 39, And all these, having obtained a bad testimony. No, a good testimony. Through what? Through faith. They did not receive the promise. Now, how does that make any sense whatsoever? They didn't receive the promise. But look what it says in verse 40. God having provided something better for them. Oh, that's not what it says. God having provided something better for us. 
Now, this puzzles me because it carries on. It says that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Hmm. They didn't get the promise. And the reason they didn't get the problem was nothing to do with their faith because he's commending their faith. He's saying they had good faith, just the same faith as the other guys did. But God allowed it for you and me. We need to see this and understand this this morning. <laughs> Why? They had this incredible testimony that through their wonderful faith, they didn't receive the promise. They went through all that. No relief. They weren't released from it. They suffered. That was their reward. <laughs> Why does God allow that to happen? Just go one chapter back. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. It says this. For you have need of endurance. So that after all you have done, the will of God, you may receive the promise. After everything you've done. You need endurance. So that after everything you've done, you may receive the promise for a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now, what do we read next? The just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, <laughs> my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. What perdition means? Spiritual rule. Spiritual rule. But we are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The danger is when we believe faith means we're going to get everything we ask for. And we don't understand that the Bible is teaching us that we need endurance. You see, in that chapter 11, some of the heroes of faith <laughs> escaped by faith. But some of the heroes of faith endured by faith. All of them had the same faith. No difference. No difference whatsoever. They all had faith. Some escaped. Some endured. God blessed them all. They had faith. That's the faith he's looking for in his children, my friends. It's not the faith on what we're going to see him do. It's the faith in him, even if he does nothing. Do you understand that? You see, <laughs> faith is believing that he is a supernatural God. Do you believe that? I do. Faith is believing he's a supernatural God. Faith is believing that when Daniel was told, Daniel, you will not pray to your God. Daniel said, ooh, I won't. It's politically incorrect to pray to my God. No. Daniel opened his windows and he prayed, full knowing the consequence that would come. And he was chucked to the lions. But God intervened and sent an angel and said, nice kitty kitty, do not bite my servants. And they didn't. And he escaped. And when they threw the other guys down, the Bible says he never even hit the ground when the lions ate him. They were so hungry. That's what God does. He is the God of the supernatural. He is the same God when David saw Goliath. And everyone else was afraid of Goliath. David didn't see how big Goliath was. He saw how big God was and how tiny Goliath was. And God delivered them through the hands of David. It is the same with Peter, isn't it? Peter goes into jail. He's in shackles. In the middle of the night, he's chained to the ground. All of his feet and his hands are in shackles, all locked up. And God sends an angel. And the shackles fly off his feet. The chains fly off his feet. The prison doors open and he walks out. I believe in a supernatural God like that. And we all love those exciting stories. <laughs> it's wonderful. What God does. But you know, many others didn't end that way. Zechariah the prophet, he was stoned to death. Remember a young man called Stephen? Chosen by the apostles as a unique 
young man, the Bible says, who was so full of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he did many, many, many miracles, this young man. And he could preach so well. And what happened to him? He was stoned to death. <laughs> he wasn't a little. In his hour when he was buckling under those stones, all the Lord blessed him was that he could see heaven. He knew where he was going. God never spared his life. Isaiah. Now the, the Jewish uh, uh, records indicate that Isaiah the prophet was cut in two. Apparently he was put in a hollow tree. By none other than guess who? Those of you who were here last week will remember a king by the name of Manasseh. Evil king. We know what happened to him. You see, <laughs> sometimes God intervenes miraculously. Sometimes he doesn't. Is there something wrong with the faith? No. Is there something wrong with your faith when nothing happens? No. There isn't. As long as you believe that he is. Do you understand that? I must be able to believe that he is in my darkest hour. Even when the Satan is right there in my ear, saying he's not listening to you, man. Why are you wasting your time praying? You've prayed about this a thousand times over. What are you wasting your time for? He doesn't exist. He's not there. He's not listening to you. He is. God says, faith is this. I believe he's here. Right here. I might be sitting beside of someone who's dying and you're pleading for their life. And you see them slipping away. Is he there? Yes, he is. Would he answer that prayer? Maybe not. Is he there? Yes, he is. Can he turn it around? Yes, he is. That's the key. We believe in a God that can do miracles, but I believe in a God that sometimes doesn't do it. That doesn't mean he can't, because he can. Nothing is impossible for him, but I have to believe that he is. <laughs> you might be listening this morning and think, you know, I, I, I honestly, I've prayed so many times to God. You don't even know about this. You don't know how many times I've laid in my bed at night and said to God, well, if you're real, if you're out there, I want you to do this and this and this, and then he doesn't. So I don't believe anymore. I'm sorry. I've asked so many times. I've asked so many times, and he hasn't. At night, when nobody sees me, I've cried into my pillow at night, and I've begged him, if you're there, if you're there, God, show me a sign. Do this, and he doesn't. I don't believe that he's there. I want to tell you this morning, he is. And that's why you're listening this morning. You need to understand he's saying to you, I am. Whether I answer or whether I don't, I am. I am there. I have always been there. There's no way on earth you can go without me. I am there. But what he wants is for you to believe him that he is. You see that? <laughs> Maybe we should have a, if not, clause in our faith statement sometimes. You think, well, that's very flaky. I can't accept that. I'm reminded of three young men that faced the fiery furnace. Because like Daniel, they refused to worship an idol. And the king said to them, you will bow before my idol. And they said, no, we won't. And they said, you see that fire? We're going to put you in there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to heat it up. Like you're going to go instantly be evaporated. You're going to burn. And they said, then we burn. I, God, is able to deliver me even from that fire. But then they said, e even if not, it doesn't matter. I'm not bowing before your idol. Because I'll tell you what. If I bow before your idol, now you might throw me in that fire. I might burn to a crisp, but I'll be with him in an instant. No worries. But if I bow to that elbow, 
you might not throw me in the fire, but he might. <laughs> and his is going to burn a lot time longer than your fire is. So they don't. Do you understand? Did that mean they had a weak, wavering faith? Not a chance. Not a chance. They believed their God was able to save them there. Is it that faith that saved them? No, it's their God that saved them. <laughs> you see that? They believe that he is God. It doesn't matter what Nebuchadnezzar said. It doesn't matter what the world said. He is God. You can do what you like. It's not going to change my mind. James and Peter. I mentioned Peter, didn't I, earlier? You know, James, the brother of John, beloved, beloved disciple, one of the few that had the privilege to go with Peter and Jesus and John to see the incredible transformation, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. He was there when he changed completely and they saw his glory and they heard the voice of God, this is my beloved son, hear him. Do what he tells you to do. James, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 12 that James was arrested by King Herod and killed him. And then it tells us, and Peter was arrested by King Herod, fully intending to do the same, Psst, killing him. But what happens to Peter? We just mentioned it earlier. No. An angel comes at night, rips the shackles off, takes the chains off, opens the door, and out he walks. So what went wrong? You think James? Mm, maybe he did something wrong. He didn't get that favor. No, he did nothing wrong. He was one of the believers. He was with Peter when they saw what happened. But yet, he died. He didn't get delivered. Maybe God loved Peter more than he loved James. I don't think so. He was one of the special ones. He was the one that was close to the Lord. Yet he didn't get that incredible miracle. You see, God is sovereign. He is God. Does that make him any less God to James or Peter? No. <laughs> we often so ask for favor and God to do a miracle that we can escape our situation or our circumstance. God wants you to give you to have the faith to be able to endure your circumstance. No matter what. No matter what. Because you see, if you can believe no matter what, then no matter what happens, you have faith. If your faith is tied to what's going to happen hmm, and nothing happens, well, then you're in trouble, aren't you? But if your faith is tied to no matter what, he is God, then it doesn't matter what happens, no matter what. I still believe. It doesn't shake my faith. That's the faith he's looking for. That's the faith the Bible is talking about that pleases God. <laughs> Many years ago when the Lord called us to this country, one of the things he did tell me, and I heard the words over and over again, and initially I didn't understand, was the words that he said he would come to this country because he wants this nation back to him. He kept saying, no strings attached, and I, I didn't I felt the freedom to ask, but one day I did ask him, I said, what do you mean no strings attached? And then he said to me, simply there's no miracles. I was shocked. No miracles. And then he explained to me, he says, I want my people to come back to me no matter what. Not because of what I do. Do you understand? Not because of I done miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle. I want them back as my kids. So that they can know that I am that I am. There's a huge difference. You see, faith is not as much receiving from God, but it is what we accept from God. Whatever he gives or allows. That's faith. That's true faith. You see, some faith, Christians only have faith in good times, but when something goes really wrong, they don't want, to, they don't want any part of it anymore. And, 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 and so faith becomes, sometimes with them, faith is all about miracles. I want to see things happening. I want to see the hand of God. I want to see miracles happening. And people come and they'll be in a church and they won't be there very long and say, you know what, there's nothing happening in this church, I'm out of here. I'm going to find something else where the Holy Spirit is moving, where I do see something moving. You see the danger of that? 
when God actually wants you to have faith, no matter what, no matter what, even if nothing is happening. Because you see, the problem is, imagine, <sighs> you know what a fa earthly father is. We love giving our kids what they want. But we also have this common sense that if you've got a child, and often happens in families, sometimes they have an only child or whatever, they have a faith, and this child comes and asks, I will give it to him, I will give it to him, I will. What happens to that child at the end of the day? They become spoiled, don't they? And when they grow up and they come up in life and the first challenge they hit, the first no answer they get, the first brick wall they hit, they fall apart. But as a good parent, we don't always just give them what they want. We don't just give in to what they want or desire or whatever. We will explain to them as a good father or a good mother, we will tell them what is right and what is fair. And we will teach them. And sometimes it hurts them greatly. It reminds me of a little story that I, 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 I read. His father says to his son, his son got his driver's license, you see. It was Nathan's age, you see. And he gets his driver's license. So he says to his dad, you know, dad, how about getting me a car now, you know? So his dad says to him, I'll tell you what. If you get your grades up, I see they're hovering around about C. C close to D. You get those grades up to at least a, you know, a grade B. And you start reading your Bible. And you go to church. And you cut your hair. I'll get you a car. Well, the young man took up the challenge. So, the next thing his father notices, wow, his grades are touching A now. He's really done something about this. Every night I see him reading his Bible. He's off to church every Sunday. The son comes to me and says, Dad, I've, I've done what you've asked for me. My grades are nearly an A. I go to church every Sunday. I read my Bible every night. He says, son, what about your hair? He said, but dad, I read in the Bible that many of the guys in the Bible had long hair. The chances are the apostles even had long hair. They all had long hair. He says, did you see something else in the Bible? They all walked where they wanted to be. <laughs> see, a wise father will not always give you exactly what you want. Because he wants you to have faith in him, no matter what. No matter what. <laughs> you see, the reason is, God never promised us that we won't have a life of difficulty. As a matter of fact, Jesus said you will. But he does promise us ultimate victory. That you can be assured. What is that ultimate victory? It's the victory he won on the cross. When he said, in this world you will have tribulations. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Look at the cross, man. Jesus in the cross defeated the final enemy that is death. He defeated death. <laughs> That's the ultimate victory he promises you and me. We don't like talking about death, do we? That's a grim subject. But one thing I can guarantee you, unless Jesus comes to take his church away, every single one of us sitting in this room will die. It happens. It happens. I know of two guys that didn't. Enoch was one, and Elisha was the other one. The rest all died. Moses, all of them, they died. We will all eventually die. It's a grim subject, but it's a fact. But you see, he promises us ultimate victory. And the victory is the minute you die, you open your eyes and you realize what that victory is. And the first thing is you're going to say is, wow, death, you truly have been swallowed up in God's victory. <laughs> death, where is your sting, man? You see that? You'll be in a twinkling of the eye. What was all that fuss about? Why was I clinging to life? Another story, a pastor, he goes on a Sunday, or Saturday at least, it wasn't a Sunday, there were church on Sunday. On a Saturday, he takes his whole congregation out for a family day to the beach. 
And they're all together having barbecues and kids are out there swimming and having a lovely time. And one of the congregation members gets swept away and is in trouble, screaming for help. And the pastor's out there. He's waving for the, for the, for the, for the lifesavers. Get out there, get out there. And he's, he's, he's on his mobile. He's got 911 on the phone. And he's, he's directing and getting it just to help this guy out of trouble. And the guy comes up to him and says, Pastor, I don't understand. He says, what do you understand, young man? He says, every Sunday. You've been preaching to your people to get into heaven. Now that guy's got a chance to go and you're trying to stop him. <laughs> you see, death shouldn't be a problem. That's where the victory lies. Every single miracle you will see on the face of this earth except the miracle of salvation will pass away. Someone can rise from the dead this very morning, but he will die again. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after four days, but he died again. I remember Paul raised that guy that he preached to sleep, remember? And he raised him from the dead, but he died again. Those that had their eyes and sight received, they eventually died. That guy that received that wonderful gift that came out leaping and, and praising God for joy, he died. Miracles are temporary on this earth. And if we believe in that, then we are on shaky ground indeed. God wants you to believe that he is. Remember Jesus. <laughs> there wasn't too many that did as many miracles as Jesus. Did. The Bible says if all the books, the world wouldn't be able to contain all the books if they had to write about everything that he did. Did they all believe in him? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Jesus actually got angry. I remember when he had the, remember the five uh, uh, loaves and the two fishes and, and he fed that 5,000. Then he went over, over across the sea and they had the storm and then all this lot came and followed him. He actually got annoyed to them when they followed him. He said to you, you didn't follow me because you want to hear the word. You followed me because of the miracle. Because you saw me feed him. You're running after the miracle. You're missing it. <laughs> he did that to show who he is. He didn't that. Do that so that people can run after those things. God wants you to believe that he is no matter what. That's true faith. That's true faith. For miracles will go. Romans 8.35 says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? No one. Tribulation, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Then it says, as it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That sounds moonlight and roses for a Christian. But it says, yet in all things we are what? More than conquerors in Christ Jesus who loved us. We are more than conquerors because you understand that no matter what happens, I believe that he is. And I'm not tied down by what I see. I believe. I believe he can, even when he doesn't. That's the difference. That's the faith that he wants to see from us. Even John the Baptist reminded of him. He had an awful time when he was locked up in jail. Now, John the Baptist, we know about his faith. We know Jesus said he was one of the greatest that ever lived. But yet, when John the Baptist was put into prison, the Bible says that he, he had his doubts. This was the man that baptized Jesus. So he said, behold, the Lamb of God. He heard God speak from heaven. This is my beloved son. No doubt. Suddenly he's in trouble. He's in jail. And he knows he's soon going to lose his life. And he's probably thinking, why isn't Jesus here? Where is he? Where is he? Why isn't he here to save me? He had his doubts. And so the Bible says in Matthew 11, verse 2, he says, John was in prison. Uh, uh, and he, said, he sent two of his disciples and said to, to Jesus, he said, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? He had proclaimed him as the Son of God. He had heard God's voice from heaven saying, this is my Son. Now when he's in trouble, he's saying, are you really? Are you really? Why did he say that? Because he expected to be delivered, and he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't. 
Jesus gets word and turns back and he says to, says to the disciples, go back and tell John the gospel is being preached to the poor man. The blind are receiving their sight, the deaf are hearing, even the dead are walking. I am he and I am here. And I believe John was comforted by those words and he could go in peace knowing that he is. He didn't deliver him, but he did encourage him. And that's what we need to understand. <laughs> God doesn't measure our faith by the miracles that we either see, do, or receive. He measures your faith on the ones he doesn't. On the times that you stand firm, no matter what happens. On the times that you're willing to say, yes, I don't understand, but I believe you. you don't, you're not answering, but you are. I know you're here. It doesn't seem like it right now. Everything around me is falling apart. But I know you are. I believe you are. That's faith. That's the faith that Jesus won. That's why Job was, Job was singled out as a unique man of faith. Because Job could say, naked have I come into this world. Naked I will leave it. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really shouldn't matter. No matter what. That is faith. Your faith feeling a bit shaky this morning. Maybe you even say this morning, well, I still don't know if I really believe in this God you're talking about. Maybe you feel a bit like that Russian guy. You don't really believe in God. But deep down, somewhere, Deep inside you, there's something that you know, that you know, that you know, that he is God. And all he's asking this morning is just surrender to him. Just surrender to him. Just come before him and acknowledge him that he is God. Accept him wherever you are this morning. Accept him this morning wherever you are. Open up your heart and receive him this morning, just as that Russian guy did. And the glory of God will come into your heart. You will, you will experience something you never knew was possible in your life. When Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, comes into your heart and changes you. You have to believe that he is. That's the first. And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You see, when you believe that he is, he rewards you. He doesn't reward you by maybe giving you all the miracles of the things you want, but he will reward you one day. And you open your eyes and you see him face to face. You will know that was the reward he was talking about. What good does it mean if he rewards me down here with a mighty miracle? What good does it help me if I pray, Lord, let me win some huge amount of money and I'll be awfully rich and I'll help all the others and bless all the churches and the thingies around me. What good does it do to me if I can't open my eyes and see him one day? But if I stand and see him face to face, suddenly all the things on this earth do become strangely dim and they have no more importance. And it doesn't really matter whether I've received my sight, whether I've received my healing, whether I've received anything. It doesn't matter because he is God. That's the faith he's looking for. Believe that he can do it, but believe in him even if he doesn't. He is God. Maybe we understand now what Hebrews says in the very first verse we read. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things seen? No. The evidence of things not seen. That's faith. When you can faith it even though you don't see it. I hope that blesses you this morning. Understand that there's the faith that God wants for you. Now, there's a song I want us to play. I'm just going to pray and then Mike is going to put it up for us. And I just want you to sit still and listen to the song for a few minutes. And it really talks about that. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. That you are faithful and just. And, Lord, help us. Help us in our faith. That we can have the true faith that, you, that pleases you. That pleases your heart. That no matter what happens, we will always believe.
that you are who you say you are. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Mike, thank you. Let's just listen to the song a moment as he plays it for us. The word should be coming up there as well. But just listen to it prayerfully as I would come and then I'll just close the meeting.